Welcome everyone to this presentation, a joint presentation with Metaphor.inc and Conscious, the Consciousness Cafe. And we're talking with Fabi Presslar about the printing and publishing process. And uh, I was telling Fabi before we got started that it seems like half of the work of writing a book is this solitude, you know, of the author uh, writing, researching, and doing all this work, organizing the book. But then when you get it to a certain point, you really have to start relying on other people for editing, different types of editing, for printing and publishing. And then if you're interested in marketing, you may need help with marketing your brand as well as marketing your book. And Fabi has had 25 years of experience doing this with uh, Spark Publications. And I, just a disclaimer up front is I've used Fabi and Spark for all four of my books that I've written. So that's the connection that she and I have. But uh, they're a custom book publisher uh, and have been in the business for a long time, have won a lot of awards for their clients. And uh, baby, you have the honor and privilege of having your husband and daughter working with you as well. I absolutely do. It um, was actually one of those things that kind of made everything come full circle because I started this firm in order to be home with them. And so then 10 years later, then they came on board and now we're at 25 all together with a great team. That's cool. And you've won a lot of awards. You talk or you uh, have in your bio some of the awards for your clients, but then uh, awards for you. I put some in the write up, but could you talk to us a little bit about that to let us know a little bit more about you and yourself? Oh, a little bit more about me. Um, I started this whole journey as a graphic designer and, you know, went into working in, in other people's companies. And um, actually I became an art director at the first job that I got out of school and just kept growing and building teams from there. And, um, you know, I started working with some big companies and like the entertainment companies that had the creative departments. And, you know, I, I was running a creative department that was, you know, managing like the $50 million worth mm. of the entertainment assets and loved it, enjoyed it. We started doing some books. I really enjoyed that part. And then I was recruited to a technical firm doing the behind the scenes, the pre-press, everything before the printing. So, um, everything that I've kind of had all these great dots connected from all these different parts within my career. And I was, you know, dedicated to everything I was doing, which unfortunately made me not be as dedicated to my family. And mm. that's not the way that I wanted to live my life. And so I decided to let the jobs go and actually be home with my family so that my daughter, you know, would have somebody home when she got home and mm -hmm. my husband, I, you know, somebody has got to eat. Right. So <laughs> we just, you know, fixing the meals and, and having great family time. And when my daughter was in her senior year of high school, she was like, mom, I've got this. Cause I was turning down work. Cause I was working from home. Mm. And anyway, it gave me the opportunity to expand the business and start hiring some really great talent and, did that for a few years until it was just time to make another major move. And my husband is creative director working with McClatchy in their mm. magazine division. Mm. And he, for the first time ever, got a little bit um, not happy with the position he was in. And we talked about it, put all our cards on the table and decided that he would replace me as creative director and I would move in as president. And we just kept growing and hiring and doing some amazing work from there. And so the awards um, from the company, we've, you know, for our client work, we've actually celebrated our clients with over 300 industry awards for, mm -hmm. you know, great design work and um, great publications. The wonderful things that I have gotten to win were just amazing awards where, you know, I would just tell my story of entrepreneurship and how I got here and, you know, that's been celebrated in, in multiple ways. No, that's great. And before we got started, you, you told us that French is your first language. 
It was, yes. Obviously, and, by the accent, it's not prevalent in this moment. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you've you've spent time all over the east coast of uh, the United States and over in Europe as well. Uh, how how did that upbringing affect your life? I think it made me have a more inclusive perspective on life and people and humans and emotions just to be able to know that my opinion isn't always the only one and to be able to ask better questions and include other people's perspectives into just the different ways that we do anything in life. Right. So tell us about the different authors that you work with. I know you you do books, but you also do magazines and you do other things as well as part of uh, Spark Publications. So uh, tell us about the different authors that you work with and maybe uh, if some of them are better than others, some are persnick persnickety, some are uh, just fun to work with and hilarious. Well, we work with primarily um, entrepreneurs and business owners on the book side. So they're all entertaining, persnickety, control freaks and amazing people all in one. <laughs> so yeah. um, we're just kind of, you know, from the same same, same teams there. The primary books that we do are all nonfiction books that really help make something better in humanity, whether it's concepts, whether it's um, trades, it's, it's all nonfiction books that help grow a business, a brand, or a platform. And then the magazines that we do are all very large national association membership magazines for different B2B trades. Mm -hmm. And um, then I have a, a digital design division. So we don't market that at all in the sense that we really kind of reserve that for our clients to do their book websites, um, any invitations or any marketing design needs that they do. But it's all design. It's all started from the core of design. And from there, um, really just grew the opposite ends, you know, so the editing became exceptionally critically important. So mm. we expanded into that later on. Yeah. And and I know with, with my books, I've used your illustrators Yes, and, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, illustrations and design. And, and then also too, there's a lot of, just like with an editor, uh, an illustrator can simplify all these complex things that you come up with and make them look pretty and, and keep them all the same style and design throughout the book that is something people who are trying to do this all on their own find it a little bit more difficult to do. Don't have those skills. It's all about really understanding who your audience is going to be and how you want to speak with them and to them and really clarifying and consolidating those messages to where it's even better. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the printing and publishing process a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I think people on the call know about, you know, writing a book or know a little bit about writing a book, you know, organizing it, uh, outlining it, um, getting an idea of who your audience is. And, mm -hmm. and you may not even know who your audience is while you're writing the book either. That's probably something that as you publish the book, it's like, who's it for? But uh, you- It's good to know while you're writing though. It saves you a lot of time. <laughs> it, it, it does, but there's just so much more that goes into this process of, of doing a book or doing some kind of work that uh, is who you are. It talks a little bit about yourself about your background, your knowledge and expertise uh, to actually bring that out and make it something that people would want to read and uh, comment on and actually utilize. Absolutely. So the biggest thing to really, really focus on is really who this book is going to be for and what you need it to accomplish. And that's the actual core of every everything that we start with. Because once you have your initial manuscript, you know, we meet a lot of clients where they haven't written a word yet, or they have that initial rough draft. Mm -hmm. And that initial rough draft is typically where most authors or you know, people think that they're done. <laughs> and that's where it all starts. So once you've done your, you know, four, five, six revisions, to your manuscript, then it's ready to go to a developmental editor. And that developmental editor will make sure that the book's structure is cohesive. Mm -hmm. It will make sure that 
any timelines that are in it, any of the factual information and any of the um, the storylines are actually consistent. Um, we've had a a journalist that had worked on a book for seven years, and mm. you think that gets to be mind boggling. Mm. You know, it was a 70,000 word manuscript. And if you're working on something for seven years, the developmental right. editor ends up finding lack of continuity end up, you know, sometimes you thought they were born in, you know, 1947. And then later on, you talk about 1946. And so they, they find those kind of things. And then once you go through a whole um, developmental edit, they're not doing, they're not copy editing. So they're not finding your typos. They're finding the structure. And then after that process is done, then you go into the editing, the copy editing process, mm. and then they go through and find your sentences that feel a little garbled and, you know, your punctuation, lots of little tiny red dots in your red lines, you know, <laughs> you know how that feels, Mark. It's like, oh, you feel yes. like you got it done to a level of almost perfection. And then you give it to a copy editor and yeah, that's a whole different thing. It, it and really so sometimes is. Sometimes that can go a couple rounds also, depending on the author and the level of skill that they had and what was discovered. But once that's done and your manuscript is completely approved, we have um, a strategy again. So we have a strategy test in at the beginning to know who your audience is because the developmental editor needs to make sure that you're speaking to your audience as well. And through the strategy sessions, we will make sure to find out what you really need to get out of the book because it's very different. And we found that with all of our clients too. So you want to write a book, but why did you want to write it? Mm. Who did you want to write it for? Mm. And the why you wanted to write it can be very different from person to person. With us, again, we're all, they're all business owners and it's all nonfiction. So they're trying to grow something or they want to do something or trying to impact something. So getting clear on what you really need to do for the book with the book and what the book's going to do for you will help you really help you figure out how you're going to market it, how you're going to write it and how long it needs to be. So it's a lot of those initial questions you really need to ask yourself about that. If you're not working with someone that's going to ask them for you, <laughs> like yeah. I do. Yeah. And, and this is a very important part of the process too, because yes. up to this point, you've kind of been all up in your head, you know, and, and I know going on the fiction side, you've developed all these characters, you've developed all these plot scenes, and it's similar with nonfiction, but I, I think fiction is a little bit easier to describe. It just gets so complex that if you don't have someone who's keeping the continuity there together for you, and especially with a nonfiction as well, people either lose interest or they you lose credibility with uh, your work. And, and I just see that as a real essential part of the printing and publishing process that a lot of people don't think about, but it, it's very important. And uh, it's not just editing for grammar. It's editing right. for all these other things as well. Right. right. And, you know, and so that's the editorial side of it. But then knowing, again, who your audience is and what you need to accomplish with the book. And what I'm saying by that is that we have clients that, you know, never intend to sell their books. We have clients mm. that intend to sell a great many books because their book needs to become part of their service business is now a new product. And then you have mm. some that incorporate their books as part of workshops. So you really need to know how your book's gonna work so that that helps, that helps you decide what the look of the book is gonna be and the functionality of it. So mm. you don't always think about that when it's you know just a straight trade book. But like with Mark's book, he had to take people through a journey and that journey had to be very visual because some of those words just blow people's minds. And so if you don't have, you know, those illustrations and those illustrations need to be in the right place, they've got to illustrate a very complex um, scenario that only lives in Mark's head until he was able to explain it in a way that one of our illustrators could really turn that into something else. But because Mark has clarity, then his book is, you know, consumable. You can actually understand what's going on. So if you have very complex ideas and you have a hard time articulating them, 
it's going to be very difficult for someone to understand what's happening in your book and, yeah. and the storyline that you have. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about spirituality and metaphysical authors, a number of people like to do autobiographical work when they talk about their own spiritual experiences or about all the questions and issues and stuff that they've had to deal with. And, and then some of the things that happen afterwards, uh, that's a different type of editing from just like a straight nonfiction work as well, isn't it? It is. But then again, you have to go back to what the author is, was really needing to accomplish. So if you're wanting to fill workshops, then you're not going to just make it a memoir where you're dumping out your life story. It's got to have, it's got to have much more um, impact and information and lessons learned. So it's it can't it's not going to be just a story, depending on what you want to do with it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong doing with that. We really urge our authors to infuse their personal story into the business side of things, you know, and there's many reasons to do that. If you're teaching, if you're instructing on a particular topic, then infusing your personal story into it makes it much more valuable for many reasons. One of those reasons is, is that nobody else can take that story from you because it's right. your life experience, right? Yeah. So we talk about that with leadership books. How many leadership books are out there? There's a lot. Mm. But if you take that and you infuse your leadership style, your personal stories that helped you learn these lessons, then it becomes much more retainable for the audience that you're speaking to and that's reading to be able to take those lessons and and learn something from them and apply it for themselves. That's great. And uh, that's part of this process leading up to actually doing the printing work and making the printing decisions for your Oh, we're not well. at printing yet, Mark. No, <laughs> we're not there I'm, yet. Oh my gosh. Well, let's take us, take us to the next step, baby, because of Okay. That. So yeah. you know who your audience is, you know how you want them to be able to use the book, you know how they need to consume the book. So then it needs to be designed that way. Mm. So you've got to have a cover that if you're wanting to retail your book in any way, shape, or form, your cover needs to resonate with who your audience is. So, you know, what is, if you're speaking to a divine feminine audience, then your cover will reveal that. If it's something that, you know, is much more esoteric, then something could be that way. If it's something that's more factual and some hard hitting things, then mm -hmm. The cover kind of describes without a single word what they're getting ready to experience. And then you have your, your subhead, your title treatment and your um, subtitle. And that kind of explains it even further. So you can have a great kind of short and quirky title and then explain it better with your, your subtitle. Right. And so you have all three of those elements that are working together, either against you or for you <laughs> with that. So that comes with a design. So, yes, you can get a really quick design if you have a poetry book and this is just kind of a personal thing. You're just wanting to self-publish. It's OK that it's not going to be a complex cover. But then all this science and, you know, design goes into it if you're wanting it to be a more marketable book. So, so it's not like just get a copy of Microsoft Word and go out there and, and create a cover. You can and, do and... that, but you're going to get that <laughs> level of result. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a lot of thought goes into just the whole process. I mean, I hope this is all coming out for everybody on, on the call is just that it's a lot more than you might think or, or than you might realize that you have to go through just before you even get the the final printed book you hold in your hand. I know you, you mentioned that in, in the description for the presentation. It's an awesome feeling to get a printed book in your hand, but there is so much work that goes into it, even between the time that you deliver that final uh, edited copy to an yes. editor That's where to, it starts. <laughs> to get it going. And, and the design is, is important too. And I know, and you the know, layout. and, That's and Spark did a great job on the layouts for my book. But uh, if you aren't familiar with it, if you don't have expertise with it, you can do something pretty crappy and or, or average. <laughs> let me say that. 
because uh, I've I've seen I've seen all kinds, but you need a professional or someone who has experience with it to do something that looks really nice. And I think that invites the reader too when they pick up the book and go past the cover. But you were you were right about the cover too being very important. And uh, how many seconds do people have or do authors have when someone's in a bookshop or on, online looking at books? You can Is, test that yourself next time you go on Amazon and you're just looking through something or walking through a bookstore. And it's like, you know, if that book doesn't call you, you may never touch it. You may never pick it up. Yeah. yeah. And as you were mentioning the inside the page layout. I mean, there are so many options with that as well. It's like, what age is your audience? You know, what point size are you going to do? Are you going to use sans serif or serif fonts? And the sans serif will give you a much more casual feel, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes a, a more fun. And then you get to the serif. And again, is it going to be more condensed? Is it going to be wider? If you know how your audience is going to use it, then it becomes a little easier to make those decisions. And just like we did with Mark, where those decisions are made, like for us during that strategy session, it may, another publisher, it may be their intake session or, you mm -hmm. know, some of those kind of meetings where you're really answering those really deep questions. And um, at the end, I think I'm going to give you all, it's, um, it's an assessment. It's called a book success predictor. And it's got some really good questions for you to think about and just see where you are in the process of um, of really, you know, getting all these things thought together. Oh, that's cool. Uh, do you think we might could get a, a link to it that we could put on the metaphor.inc site so that we could refer people to you to it? Is sure. that the way you like to do that? Yeah, we can do that. I've got it on a, a little landing page. And so some of the things that we're talking about today, there's like a, a little download on there as well. So I will just put that in the chat. I think, I think I can do that. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, if anybody we'll wants it. to do that and keep in mind, there's a lot of different type of books. So, you know, when you're talking about a nonfiction book, it could be anything from a business book, a memoir, a reference book, a workbook journal, um, a cookbook, you know, a coffee table or collector book. You can have a purposeful mm -hmm. story book. You can have any kind of specialty publication. Again, once you know what you need to do next, if you're, you know, a conference speaker, you know, you want to know who your audience is and how they want to use those books. Yeah. Well, and and we can also talk about the book size as well. There's standard yeah. sizes and non-standard sizes. There's different types of binding. There's all these other little things that you don't think about, you know, in publishing a book. And um, I don't know if Amazon walks you through that if you try to do it all yourself. Uh, um, Amazon's gotten a few more options lately. So I'll give you a couple terms so that, you know, when you we're used to hearing hardback, but hardback is actually case bound. So mm -hmm. case bound is is your your hardcover wrapped book. If you put a cover on top of the case bound book, it's a jacket. So you've mm -hmm. taken those off or you've left them on. So different ones, your standard trade publications, your soft cover books are perfect bound is what it's called. So it's a soft cover book is called perfect bound and it has a spine. Most of the um, online printers and print on demand, you really need to have at least 120 pages minimum in your book in order to have text on a spine. So if you want your book to look like a book and not a pamphlet when it goes on someone's shelf, you want to take it to at least 120 pages minimum. Hmm. And how many words is that normally? Typically about 30,000. Okay. Wow. Of course, you can spread it out and you can design it much different. So the less yeah. words you have to try to get to that, you're going to need some really good design expertise. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I was sitting there thinking, I said, bigger font, bigger margins, uh, smaller yeah. book size, you know, all these other things. But um, yeah, and and people people do all different variations of that, too, with different measures of result or different uh, different results in doing Just it. Just know that there are different um, distribution patterns for some of the different book sizes. So if you're going through Ingram and you're picking custom sizes, then they will not include you in global distribution. So, mm -hmm. you know... Um, 
some of the more global distribu distribution options want more standard size books so they don't have to have all kinds of different things as they're shipping them out. So there's just a lot of different things to think about. Okay. Well, and, and you talked about the publishers. You know, I, I know everybody's familiar with Amazon, but you mentioned Ingram. Who's uh, Ingram and what Ingram, do they do? Ingram has um, a self-publishing division as well. And so if you could, you could go to I think ingramspark.com. If you're looking to self-publish, then you can, you know, um, upload your book there. But Ingram has a lot of other great options um, as a publisher where, you know, we're putting the books on any online retail store once you put it up on Ingram versus Amazon. You have to remember if you're going to put it in a bookstore, you can't go through Amazon. Amazon bookstores do not take Amazon printed books. So KDP. And and that's that's a very important point too. But I when you sent mentioned uh, Ingram Spark, I just wanted to say is that a subsidiary of Spark Publications? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> we had the name Spark before they did, but they're a little bit bigger than us and they just blocked us on an IP as well because they're getting ready to do something on their nonprofit side that we were doing and we couldn't call it Spark because of their initiative. So anyway, wow. It's well, good to be a small business, but sometimes the big guys will squash you a little bit. <laughs> there you go. So so Amazon, Kindle, Direct Publishing, and Ingram Spark are like the two big publishers in the U.S. Are, are there, there is are there some third new or ones fourth? coming out. Yeah, but yeah, there are some new ones coming out, but you have to make sure that uh, to understand how you're wanting to distribute your book so that whoever the print on demand firm is that it either goes through Amazon or if not, then you're going to have to establish your own Amazon store and then have the books brought in there. Yeah. And if you wanted to distribute to like a Barnes and Noble or Books a Million or, you know, all these other places, what you were saying is you you don't want to use Amazon. You, uh, you 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 want to use Ingram Spark, but then if you use Ingram Spark, can you sell on Amazon? Yes. Back in the back, so yes. Amazon will be a consumer of Ingram Spark books. You have to remember, Amazon is a distributor. Period. They sell socks, draws, books, whatever. So they are distributing and your book. They're not marketing it unless you pay for it. And they're not printing them. So KDP is actually the print on demand printer for Amazon. So it's actually owned by Amazon. Okay. And when we talk about print on demand, that's different from the, uh, I guess, traditional printing and publishing where yes. you have to get like a thousand book minimum order or whatever. Print on demand right. is like a big copy machine almost, isn't it? They do one-off books and you can order one book, 10 book, a hundred books for print on demand. But yes, those are printed per order. And, and how do you do that? Is it, a, you know, like a bunch of PDF files that they do to kind of put it all together just to give people an idea of what printing is uh, on printing. Now, on The demand. initial process is that once you've designed the book, you've laid it out, you've approved all your proofs, then you process the book to do press ready PDFs. You do a separate for the four page cover or in all the inside pages. So you have those PDFs and those PDFs get uploaded to your traditional printer or they get uploaded to your print on demand printer. So that processing is a very similar way of doing it. We have to process the files differently because mm -hmm. everyone's got different print um, presets that they need. And so the designer that you're working with should be able to help you with that as well. Right. And, uh, but then when somebody orders a book that's print on demand, all that it's doing is pulling two PDF files from a database mm -hmm. somewhere, sending it to a printer and they print the inside, wrap the cover around it, glue it together and put it in a, a mailer and ship it out. That's it. That's all they're doing. <laughs> that's a lot. Wow. Of, yes. <laughs> Yeah. And they're doing One. that. And, you know, through um, KDP and Amazon, they're doing that in, you know, a couple of days. And if you're rushing it or expediting it or doing prime, then it's even faster. And the good news is sometimes that works great. And sometimes your pages are upside down and you oh, never yeah. know it. And, the, yeah. you know, people, yeah, there's, we've heard all kinds and seen all kinds of things. So. Uh, another reason to pay attention to the details. And then also too, you know, the, the cutting of the outside edges, you know, how much the trim on the outside of the books 
and things, there's a lot of details that just a tiny little thing could really screw up what you're trying to do. It's it's almost like making a cake. You know, if you mess up with one ingredient or you mess up with a time in the oven or, uh, you know, you don't handle it right, you know, you can just mess up the whole works. It you can, but like honestly, a lot of those print-on-demand printers have really good um, tutorials for you to, to watch and learn. So a lot of those things, I mean, they make money when your books are good. So they're they're going to give you the resources. As long as you want to take the time to learn how to build the house, you can learn how to build the book. And you can learn all this through KDP and through Ingram Spark. And um, there's quite a few others as well. Yeah. So you have tons of resources. It's an amazing time to, to, to work, to self-publish your own book. And if you want it to be highly more marketable, then, you know, you have to invest in either a team of people or a publisher to help you get that done. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that books have is this little barcode on the back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can either, I guess, I don't know, can Amazon just give you one or do you have to buy one or what do you do to kind of get that? And, and then it has to look a certain way. It has to be registered or in a certain database somehow. If you're going directly through and self-publishing and having um, Ingram or KDP do it, they will include some of those because then that becomes kind of like their book. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that becomes listed as, as, your, as your publisher. If you are your publisher or you're working with a publisher, then you will get ISBNs and barcodes from the publisher. Yeah. And, and you have to have a separate barcode for each different type of book. Like between a perfect Absolutely. bound and a case bound or and an another e ISBN. I have to have an ISBN and a barcode, except for ebooks don't require barcodes, but they do have an ESPN, ISPN, ESP. Wow. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> and and then if you wanted to do an audiobook too, yeah. you know, that's a separate ISBN. And and what does ISBN stand for? International IS yeah. Yeah, system that. for book notation or whatever. I don't know what it is. Right. But then you take those, um, you take those numbers, the ISBN numbers, and then you can file your copyright status and then the Library of Congress. And so the Library of Congress will store each one of those. So for our clients, after we finish publishing their book, we package up um, all the versions of their books, actually the printed copies, and then we send them to the Library of Congress. Wow. A lot more involved than what people would think. It just depends on the quality that you want to do and the level of investment that you want to make to get the, to that level of quality. Yeah. So what about the the long-term effects of what you've done? You know, if I try and go cheap on the printing and publishing versus tr take my time and really make it look professional, how does that affect the longevity of the book being out on the market or does it not matter at all? Again, it's going to depend on what your process is, because what we tell our clients and you you told everybody here, it's like, you know, when you write it, that's just halfway, but it's not. By the time you write it, you get it edited, you design, you publish the book. Once you're holding your book, then you're at the halfway mark. Mm, and, and what do you mean by halfway? I thought I just printed it. I thought it's done. You have a book. And you can hold that book and rock it every night, or you can begin to market it and use your public oh relations, your marketing, your promotions. Nobody's going to know it's there if you just hold your book. You put it on Amazon, nobody knows it's there. There are millions and millions and millions of books on there. You have to market. You have to promote public relations. If you are wanting to get yourself in the media and have the media speaking about your topic and the book that you have, then you need some really good PR efforts. And if you were talking to the media or let's say even a podcast host, a lot of times they'll buy your book to and evaluate how good you are as an expert or as a potential guest, maybe. Correct. And if you're going to conferences, they can, you know, if you're the, the keynote speaker, then you build in, you know, the purchase of several, you know, X number of books along with your, your speaking fee, or you forego your speaking fee for X amount of books. Hmm, that's interesting. I'd never heard that before. Yep. That's, that's pretty cool. Tactic. Yeah, because sometimes if you um, are going and speaking to an organization, they do not have speaker fees, but they have budget and their education 
department. And so their books sometimes fall under educational versus speaking fees. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's, that was interesting. And then there's, there's all sorts of competitions too. You know, you talked about winning awards for your clients. Uh, there's book competitions galore out there, I think. There are, some are more credible than others. And so you're looking at what type of competition is it is really you're just buying into all of it and it's really a promotional competition or is it one that is working off of merit so you really have to know what the competition is for what the end results can help you get and whether it's seen as credible or not <laughs> yeah and and then what about getting into book reviews you have to have a professional looking book to get like in the new york times book review or i don't know what some of the other book reviews are like but it, yeah. it and that's a whole different thing that you have to be careful with because as um, an independently published book or a self-published book chances are you're not going to get on the new york times list it's a it's a very um it's a very gamified, what can we say? There's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of processes and avenues and who can actually submit and all that. So, you know, the the other thing is is that being called a bestseller. So you see people that just say, you know, they're a best-selling author on Amazon. Well, let me tell you a secret about that. You can put your book in you know, a subcategory, subcategory, subcategory at midnight and it sell 25 books and become a bestseller. Now, oh, really? if that Mark, that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, that's why you have to be really clear as to what's important for you on your book. So we have we have some clients that have become bestsellers. We we have clients that don't sell their books and really, you know, wrote notes to 12 of their moonshot gold clients, people that they would love to have and send out, you know, a dozen books to these folks and then didn't need to market their book because they landed four huge clients that helped them take their company to like the next two levels of what they expected. Hmm. And then all the way on the other side, we have a client that we uploaded their books on Amazon. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, they had sold 65,000 books. But let me tell you, my goodness, their audience, he has a membership of over 160,000. Hmm. So just know the audience that you have, that's going to yield you about 1% of book sales. Wow. Wow. A so, lot. You know, a hundred people. <laughs> That's Good. great. I love it. That's so, why you have to market. So, so let me ask you one more question before Q&A. Okay. Is uh, what are the three most important aspects of printing and publishing your book? What are the th three things that would give you the biggest bang for the buck if you're printing or, or publishing a book? Well, I'm changing the way that you're asking that sentence. Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to restate it as what will help you make your book most successful. First of all, have clarity on what that means to you because successful to Keisha putting her 12 books out there gave her, you know, built her a million dollar business. Hmm. Whereas if somebody else is marketing the books and has sold you know, a thousand of them to friends, family, and all these great people, but it didn't increase their business, then which one is more valuable? Mm. So getting clarity on what you actually need, want, must have your book to do is the critical number one thing. Knowing who your audience is also gets you that. Now, of course, you absolutely have to write something of value that is mm. beautifully written and well edited and beautifully designed that falls under the publishing. Mm -hmm. So clarity on what you need to do, a well-published book, and then a great marketing and promotions plan. Mm. Wow. There you I go. heard anybody's feelings tonight. I sure didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've given us all food for thought, I, yeah. you know, I, because I'm, I'm sitting here, it's been a year since my book was published and I'm, I'm just now getting on the podcast trail. Yeah. And, and we've and had yeah. uh, meetings, you know, with podcast hosts and podcast guests and stuff, but there's so many different ways to market your book. 
Yes. And uh, I guess it's just like, you know, as entrepreneurs, you need to have multiple streams of income. So you need to have multiple streams of uh, uh, marketing for your book if you're going to be successful with that as well, it seems And like. you can exhaust yourself trying to do the marketing. So you really need to, you can do your own plan, create your plan, but just make sure that anytime you are on a podcast, you are speaking to an audience that you're going to resonate with. Mm. You know, so Mark, if you're going to go speak to a Mary Kay audience, you probably aren't going to sell any books. Probably not. You know, so, I mean, that's kind of a, you know, silly um, way of putting that, but right. don't get excited because you've got a podcast interview. Just make sure that audience is who you need to speak to and with and, you know, really wants to hear what you have to say. There you go. Great. Well, that's that's great advice. Uh, Leslie, I'll turn it over to you if people have questions for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Fabi. Sure. Hope this was helpful. I see Bill's got his hand raised. Uh, yeah, Bill, uh, go ahead, please. Bill, you're on mute. Okay, Bill, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, Jim, would you like to ask your question? Yes, um, maybe. I think you said the starting point is to have a manuscript. The starting point is to know, is to get clear on why you're writing a book. But as far as working with you is concerned. Oh, you can have like, we meet with people that have five ideas of what, you know, they need to have for a book and we help them get clarity, figure out what book they need to write in order to, um, to be able to move forward. So we have, we have ghost writers, strategic um, editors, developmental editors, coaches. So it's it just depends on where our clients are and where we they come into us. But for the design part, yes, and the get that process, you have to get through the pre manuscript stage and have a manuscript before we can get to the the next step. So I'm wondering if, if I'm thinking of writing a book, mm -hmm. and it's a subject that that I and a few close friends find fascinating mm -hmm. um would you be in a position to listen to the concept and comment as to whether you think it's it's got uh, legs in a broader marketplace i'm going to flip that around a little bit because everybody wants to know is the book i'm writing worth it mm -hmm. well after we ask questions and you answer those questions then you should be able to answer that for yourself I would answer it if I feel that I can help you make it successful with the mission that you have and what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Every single person on this call, everybody can write a book. Um, you just have to know why you feel like you should and what it's going to be for. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the cool thing with that um, in the in the chat where I put that um, it's for the leverage page, but it has the book success predictor on there. When you can answer those questions, then you have a better idea of whether you're ready for this book to get worked on. Mm -hmm. But the answer to your question is yes, with a series of questions and some great conversation, <laughs> then um, together we we decide if we're a fit for you. I mean, we're not a fit for everybody. There's no way. And, and we only take on 20 books a year. And are your services uh, all fee for, for service? It is. So you, you come in, we're work for hire. We help you at the deepest level that you need help with. Some of it is mostly collaborative. We worked very collaboratively with Mark on his book because there's no way we could have done his book without him. <laughs> so, um, so it is a collaborative process. You have a team of, you know, almost 10 people behind you to, to get this done you pay for the steps as they're done and then it's a hundred percent yours. And whether you decide mm -hmm. to not sell it or like our client that sold 65,000, then we don't make any more money at all. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, Bill, so, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, yeah, I had, I was, I was muted and I couldn't get through. So can y'all hear me? Okay. 
Yes. Okay. I had three questions. I think it's three. I make you want to be more. First of all, is it permissible? You said Amazon, if you publish through Amazon, they wouldn't let you, the bookstores wouldn't pick that up. Is it permissible to go through someplace like Ingram and then Amazon at the same time? Or yes, yes. I mean, without violating any kind of uh, as long as you're not doing an ebook where you click that little button that says it only goes through KDP uh -huh. through Amazon, okay. then you can you can distribute your books and ebooks, you know, 10 different places. Okay. And uh do some books start out as self-published and then get picked up by uh publishers? That does happen. And my question to you for that is why would you want to do that when you've already done the work and you want somebody to take it over for you? And well, I don't they, know if they would would distribute it better or market it better is the only thing I would I mean I don't nobody know. Nobody does that for free. Okay. I, right. I have somebody that reached out to me the other day and they had um they had a major named publisher that published their book and then didn't market it. And I'm like, what's the point? <laughs> Yeah. Also, um, some of the stuff I'm doing is like short article type stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you work with people who uh, want to get started in things like magazines just to see how mm. people react to it? I mean, there's not much there except submit it to the magazines, but in terms yeah, of... Yeah, we don't work with content. We're not a content provider. We're a custom okay. book publisher. Got it. So if you have written a lot of articles on a particular topic and those can be pulled together into a book, we've helped people take their podcasts and turn them into books. We've had them take a lot of their content and turn them into books. Got it. All right. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so Teresa asks uh, if you could give us a uh, ballpark figure about how much it would cost to work with your company for developmental entity editing and strategy sessions. Um, those are all components of publishing. So if you wanted to do an individual, just just wanted to, you know, have time with me one on one and really just have a conversation about what you could possibly do next and then not have it attached to a publishing thing, then that's a a standalone pub, um, strategy session. Those are $500. That's 90 minutes. If you're looking to publish a book, so I can, I know some of my competitors pricing and I know mine. So if you're looking to professionally either independently publish or custom publish for us, um, looking at a hundred and um, 120 pages, 30,000 words, uh, doing not the developmental edit because that can be anywhere from you know 3500 to 5000 it just depends on how complex that that needs to get most of them seem to land around you know 2500 to 3500 because they're already pretty clean cuz we've worked with them previously so that's that's kind of separate um, because you just don't know i know that if you go to a couple of our um competitive partners, then you're looking at, if you don't have a book that's already written, then you're looking at starting at 40,000. When you're working with us, we require a $2,000 deposit. We hold your hand through the pre-manuscript part, help you decide whether you're going to need a ghostwriter or help you with content grids to help you do it yourself. We are very much focused on working with small business owners. So if you're looking at a 30,000 word manuscript and 120 pages, then you're looking at starting at about 12,000 for the copy edit, the consulting, the design, the layout, the publishing. So again, that goes up depending on the level of services that you need. But if you have a good basic 30,000 word, um, you know, perfect bound book, five and a half by eight and a half, your manuscript's already done. It doesn't require any developmental edit, then, you know, it can, it could probably be about 12,000. Teresa, did that um, satisfy your question? 
I'm just wondering if if, if I don't have the forty thousand dollars or twelve thousand to start out, did, are there things that you do a la carte, like design cover design? Or Not just... currently because we're only taking on twenty books. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if you know you're a friend of Mark's and you refer us, and you know we have time within. Um, production schedules, then we could definitely talk about it. It's typically not something that we do because we pour in a lot of time, mm -hmm. energy, love, and talent into getting the whole book done. Mm -hmm. um, but as my team continues to to expand and grow, then you know, check back with check back in with us. You know, we might have some of those, but currently it's it's doing the whole the whole book. Yeah. And, and if I could add something too, once you get the printed book done, it's very simple to do an ebook, you know, just to, to translate everything to an electronic format once you get the basic things done. And uh, yeah. the, the hardest part is that first part and getting it all right and getting it accurate and getting it looking nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and depending on the complexity of your book, um, your book. Once it's the layout is done and you have all the the pages done, it could be like anywhere from five to seven dollars per page to convert it to an ebook. Mm -hmm. Unless it's Mark's book, then it's just <laughs> yeah, I gave them you fits. charge that, and then you just do fifty dollars per page. Of work. I, I gave them fits because I, I I think this last book I had sixty one illustrations. So yeah. and you those want all those... have to be anchored into the text, and every it becomes very technical. It, so. it was but if you fun. have a simple, simple book, you know, there's there's ebook processes that are simple. Well, and and sorry, Jim, I, I know you've got your hand raised, but just one other thing too is it, it's also good. Your first book, I I say I was really proud of my first book, but uh, I tell people, you know, it was crap. It was my first book that I did. You know, I was really happy with it, but. Looking back on it, you know, from my second, third, and fourth book, there was a lot of things I could have improved on, and so I'm I'm wondering, baby, is is the the little saying is do something cheap and inexpensive for your first book, so that you can get a lot of those mistakes out of the way and and a lot of those understandings out of the way. Maybe do it all black and white, do it a standard size, don't put any illustrations in it. You know, is is there some merit to that, or is it just do what it takes? It's um, it's merit depending on what you want to do. If you are a small business owner and you have a successful business, then you're not going to want to put a piece of crap out there that's going to be part of your branded image, right? You're going to want something that gets done correctly. Um, we find a lot of our clients really do the book upright the first time because they don't want to do it ever again. And then we have other clients that are on their second, their third, their fourth, their fifth book, because that falls more into their mission. Some of the others are fine. I mean, we, I'm speaking with a client now that, you know, we did their book 15 years ago and now they're thinking maybe they want to convert it to be a print on demand book, you know? So there's, yeah. Again, it's custom. It's as different for every single individual based on what you want to do with your book. So just do be careful that there aren't like hard rules about how you're supposed to do something. There's, you know, foundational things that need to be done, but that's why the clarity and what you want to do with it up front is so important. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, Jim. Jim. So Jim, before we move on to your question, if I may ask one, uh, maybe I've read um, a lot of different perspectives on this, but thinking about writing in the spiritual metaphysical space, approximately how long, how many pages would, in a range of page pages, approximately how many pages do you think it should be to even be considered? I know you said 30,000, but uh, I've also read that it should be 60 to 70,000 and I have I have some dear literary friends who have their PhD in literature and they don't think the book is worthwhile if it's not at least 70,000 words. Well, you know, it's we have books that are 120 pages that, you know, one of them sold like 85,000 copies. They're making them money. It just depends on what how you're going to use it, market it and who your audience is. So, if you don't want it to be a brochure, Take it to at least 30,000 words. Are you wanting to, to win literary awards? Is it, or do you need to get your spiritual concepts to the right people? You know, so those are the kind of things that you really think about as you're wanting to do it. So there are, 
there are rules of thumb depending on what you're trying to do. So for her, for that client, you know, she thinks her leadership clients need to have 70,000 words and, you know, a 350 page book. Uh, my audience doesn't read that many pages, you know, so, you know, you, you got to know who it's for. But great All question. Right. All right, Jim, Jim, everybody's butted you out of the way. It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Everybody gets a chance. Yeah. Uh, you said you do about 20 books a year. We take on only 20 books a year. So you must have some process for uh, deciding who you're going to take on. And there must be some people that you don't take on. Correct. So I'm finding it interesting. Uh, having read Mark's early uh, drafts in his books, and I'd ask him questions like, well, who's your audience? Um, it was a fairly technical uh, read. Yeah. Um, when you first read his stuff, it must have been challenging. How? Did, what was it about Mark that uh, uh, let him get through that uh, gate and become one of those 20 books? Right. Well, at the time, as Mark evolved, we have evolved as well. <laughs> so um, Mark was an ideal client. He had an idea of who his audience was, but he didn't necessarily write or edit to that audience in the first books, but he had, he had a vision of what he wanted to do. And his vision was in line with helping out humanity in some certain way. And it was, a, and for him personally, it was going to help him grow his vision. Now with Mark, he was evolving through each of the books mm -hmm. and we committed to being there and helping him do that. Um, if Mark from 15 years ago were to come in today and not have a clear audience, it would be a much different conversation. Yeah. And, and also too, I was recommended by another author who used Spark as well. So uh, that, Which that's is how we get way. our clients. Yeah. Because word of mouth. So we, uh, we need to slip a few bucks to Mark to have him uh, uh, speak up on our behalf. Well, it's not it's not like that. It's, um you know, coming through Mark and having a referral definitely gets you a conversation with me. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. always a good start. Um, so any of you that, you know, want to, you know, take the take the book predictor assessment. And then, um, you know, once we get that, receive the results for that, you can have, you know, a, a no charge discovery call and ask me any questions that you want. And it's just, it's a quick call, but at least it gets us started. And then if we really move into the phase where you are interested in working with us and, um, you understand the investment for it, then we just have that deeper conversation about how we're going to move forward. And if it's a fit and our timeline, you know, if we get a phone call and somebody says, yeah, I want to write a book and I want to make a, be a bestseller and sell a million copies. I'll let them know they've called the wrong publisher. Yeah. I can't, I, you know, that's not us. If you want to, if you want to write a book that's going to help you grow your brand, your platform, or your business, then let's talk about it. Yeah, and Mark's and books wanted to help him grow his self and what he was doing. And gosh, I mean, look how he evolved through writing his books. And sometimes that's that's my decision is to take somebody on that's willing to grow through a process. And, and just to add, they have a great illustrator too. And I started out with some gosh awful designs that came down to some very simple and simplistic things. And this illustrator I, has kept the same design style through all four books. I think I've reused some of those illustrations from my first book and second book and my fourth book, yeah. but it, it's, it's all been that consistency between editions. But that was one of the reasons why I continue to use Spark is because of, of that consistency, because they've kind of guided me all the way through and understand me as an author. Thank you, Mark. And keep in mind also, when I share that it's a collaborative process, then there is there is a place through the process where the client makes that final decision. Because at that point, we are work for hire. We will give you our expertise. But I'm not going to tell you that everything that comes out of our firm is exactly the way that we feel it should. Um, there are clients that overrule those things. 
-hmm. And I try to mitigate that at the initial meetings. And, you know, so it's, it's a process. I'm not going to tell you I batted a hundred percent. I did with Mark, but that's the whole thing. There you go. <laughs> yes, Phil. Uh, okay. Let, um, you have a, your hand raised? Yeah, I had a couple. Okay, so w w first, um, I wasn't planning on getting rich by writing, but it, I had in the back of my mind, it would be nice to come out in the red instead of, or in the black instead of in the red. Um, Mark, are, are you financially... Have you made money with your books or is it sort of a labor of love? So you're asking me instead of Fabi? Yeah, well, I can ask both of you. That's my first question. I got another one, but uh, are you more broke gonna, than I'm gonna you were step before into you started? That. So <laughs> I'm going to step into that because the way that books are structured in this day and age, it's that if you are looking for your book to solely make you money, Mm -hmm. then it's going to be a long process. Okay. So the books that we do have a greater mission than the book itself. Mark's greater mission was to grow through this beautiful process of what he's writing about. And now he's positioned to be able to have the book that humanity needed him to write. Mm -hmm. It took him a process to get there. And so now he has a highly professional, beautiful book that he can choose to market the way that he wants to. So if you are wanting to break even on a low end book, you can do that. If you're looking to break even on a high end book that gets you speaking engagements, that lands you clients, that is doing mm -hmm. something else then that is one of the things, Jim, that we're looking at when we're talking with clients. So that to us is success. We have to know what success looks like for you. So if you want to make a million dollars on your book, I probably won't be able to take you on unless you tell me and show me a great marketing strategy and a super audience that's already connected mm -hmm. to you that will help make that happen. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does everybody yeah, it does. get that? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's good. And that's I'm just trying to see what's realistic because I, I wasn't trying to just use that as just money first, but I, it would be nice not to go broke doing it. Yeah. Well, um, and you don't, and that's another thing is that I, I really don't want or allow our clients to go broke doing it because there has to be some, it has to make sense. And that's typically the clients that I don't take on are somebody that's too early stage and doesn't necessarily have the money to invest in it then I, some, I mostly tell them that it's probably too soon to go and to write the content, but it's it's too soon for them to invest into getting this into a really good book. Maybe they should write a blog and start posting some of the stuff, seeing mm -hmm. how it works. Okay. I tend to be brutally honest, which I think is what Mark liked yeah. about me too. Yeah, I that's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> because I, was, because I don't know if I've got the money either to go to put twelve to $40,000 yeah. And keep in mind, our books aren't 40,000 because okay. that's why we keep them low is that I, I don't sell our books our you know, don't sell our book processes where they're mm -hmm. referred to us or we're attracted in different ways. And so, you know, our book average is typically about 15,000. Mm -hmm. So we're on the much lower end than a lot that have like a flat rate. So that's why it varies. So it really depends on what pro what services and processes you're going to need yeah. specifically. And a final question. I, you mentioned that you do about 20 books a year. And I know that. So is, is it possible that if, if a client came to you and you'd said, we'd like to take you on, but we may have to wait several months because we're working at our greatest i guess potential right now but we'll yeah. put you on a waiting list and you'll be the next one up does that make sense well i try to get everybody started so okay. we're in our absolute busiest season now and we just we just landed you know a, another sixty thousand word manuscript that came in so mm -hmm. it has already gone through um, it's, it's in the editorial phase now. So we have a vast group of editorial contractors. Mm -hmm. End of year is like the worst time to actually try to get a book pushed through, but 
I make sure that everybody gets started. Okay. So we've got, we've got four of them right now that are going to be next year's book. So I work with them and get them their, their content grid. We've had our strategy session. So, you know, it's going to be several months before they're, they're coming back in. So, but I still check in with them because I'm that accountability okay. person. So gotcha. yeah. Right. So the 20 is making sure that they're not in, in um, design production because that we use a lot of that time for the magazine design. And we do that to make sure that we can keep our costs down and pass those lower costs down to our authors because they're all business owners. Okay. All know, right. Small Thanks. Business. I appreciate it. Okay, sure. Is this helpful? Are you guys getting some stuff? Okay. Um, Bill, do you still have a question? Your hand's raised. Uh, no, I'm, that's it. Thanks. Thanks okay. a lot. I appreciate it. All righty. Um, I do have a question, Katie. Okay. Do you know of any groups that uh, would do um, help somebody who I need the? <laughs> I've written a book. Um, I've asked some people to look at it, but I really would like somebody to just read the first. 15 pages and tell me uh, what their thoughts are. I really am not in a position to be able to pay anything, but I'll be more than happy to do a, um, a barter exchange. So do you know of any groups that might be operating to support one another in that way? You can look up like um, writers groups in your area. I think that's the best thing um, because you're looking to get you know, collaborative support from, from folks without necessarily it being something mission driven. So, um, I can't, I don't have sources for that because our clients don't work that way. Sure. I didn't know yeah. you might've heard, you know, because being in the industry. Yeah. And, and we're in the industry, but we're not in, you know, we're not in fictions, we're not in novels, we're not in, in writing groups, because most of our clients are business owners that don't want to be authors or don't want to be writers. They want to author a book, but not to be writers. Does that make sense? So we yeah. help them get it, you know, get it written correctly and edited. So the craft part of writing, I know there's... Um, there's, there's several different leagues and writing groups. I mean, just Google, see if there's something near you and then see if there's something online. I know I probably need to pull some, um, you know, I think there's a writing league in Charlotte. There's there's all kinds of things, but I just haven't tuned into them, which I should because that's where we got our last referral. So I need to check into them, so. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, um, Bill, I'm assuming you have not, you're still, you have not actually raised your hand. Is there anybody else that has a question or a comment? Yeah, I actually had one, another question. Okay. Um, is there a way to figure out if you take it the, whatever genre that the author has would fit in and find out what, which company would be the best to go through then? Mm -hmm. um or is that something if you got I mean, a, a query do you have that's something specific i mean i could probably do something more specific like if your book needs to be heavily marketed and you want to put more money into the marketing side than necessarily a really high-end book there are some firms some publishers that that focus on you know knocking out a book and then spending all their time and resources yeah. on, on marketing. Um, and then there's genre specific publishers. So now, you see this, for example, I do stuff that's kind of like uh, Dave Barry or not as good as, but like, like Art Buckwald or that kind of stuff. So it's short pieces that are uh, not real they're not metaphysical for sure. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter? But it's certainly not like a novel and it's certainly not like a nonfiction thing. It is um, nonfiction or it's no, not? No, it's not. No, it's, it's not. not it's not nonfiction. Okay. No, so you would find a, a publisher that works with fiction books. 
Um, so you, there's, there's quite a few out there and most of us are pretty clear when you get on our page, what type of books we work on. Okay. So if you're wanting to work with someone local, you know, do publishers near me, just Google publishers <laughs> near me and start with that and then expand it to um, publishers that would deal more specifically with the audience that you're wanting to work with. If they're going to be doing the marketing, if they're mm -hmm. not, then, um, you know, you might be looking for an independent publisher that really could just take on the book production for you. Do you have groups or people that are good at helping your writers market their books? Yes. Yeah. So we've got, we work with different, um, PR firms, marketing firms. I've got a couple book marketing specialists that we work with. So, well, not that we work with, that we can send our clients to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sure. And I will give you guys a tip on that. So when you're wanting to work with a, um, a PR firm or a publicist, you're looking mm. $1,500 to you know, $5,000 a month. That's surprising too. And we aren't talking about doing video segments or video clips on nope. your book either. That's another added expense. I think if people want to get into that. Yeah. So the thing that I would suggest is writing down exactly what you want to have happen for your marketing and do your own marketing plan or get somebody to work with you on that marketing plan and then start implementing some of those things in different phases. So your video to start with may be important to you, or it may be something you do in phase three. So, you know, we do, um, I do an, an hour long initial marketing planning session with each of our clients as well, just to, to go through a marketing checklist and options that they have, and also to listen to their marketing strategy and see if I can add anything or, you know, I had one that came to me not too long ago and she had been quoted like a $20,000 marketing strategy. And I was like, why would you do that? I said, can you afford it? She says, no, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to take out a loan. I was like, do you know how long it would take you to recoup that? Do you know, do you have factual evidence that you're going to be able to recoup the marketing dollars and sell that many books? And so after we walked through that, then we changed her marketing strategy a little bit and gave her the opportunity to really focus on the PR so that she would have more media and then be able to promote her workshops and then be able to sell your book. So it's really mm -hmm. about the strategy of what you need to do. Cause yeah, you could, you could spend ridiculous money if you just start turning it over to people that are going to help you and that you're going to pay or you're wise enough to know what your strategy is and what different types of, um, of services you're going to need to help you. Yeah. And, and that's a good point too, Fabi, is that a lot of times your book and, and how your book looks and how it communicates itself to other people, you know, is something you can leverage to help you with conference speaking, um, you know, becoming an expert on podcasts and all these other things that sets you up for, or gives you options for all these other things. That's the word I like to use. It gives you right. options that you didn't have before. And winning some good awards, some prestigious awards for the, the, you know, the design and the marketing of your book is also helpful as well. Yeah. You guys asked some good questions. I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't deflate anybody. So none of this is meant to deflate the fact that you have a beautiful, bulk of knowledge and a great story to tell. I strongly suggest that you you start writing it. You write it and then realize what you want to do with it. Realize who you need to attract. So you're in this great, great conscious group. So be conscious about what you really want to do and what this all needs to do for you. You're not going to get instantly rich by putting a book out there. But having that book be a component of something amazing that you're working to do for others, part of your service, part of your business, then it could be a very, very helpful tool. But the book itself will not make you rich. 
Well, thank you, Fabi. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. Um, I do want to say our next event is going to be on uh, Tuesday, September 12th with Judith Pennington. She's going to talk about the awakened mind and uh, helping you un unlock the potential of your brain by training it using uh, states of awareness. And uh, she's going to talk about that in our next meeting. So um, I want to thank Fabi for being here with us and answering those questions for everyone who's been in attendance. This uh, presentation will be up on YouTube uh, tonight or tomorrow. And for the people who uh, missed it tonight, they'll get to, to see it in the future as well. But um, I want to thank Fabi again for what you're doing and uh, how you're helping other people with uh, Spark Publications. And thank you for helping us tonight with the printing and publishing process for the Metaphor.Inc. and spiritual and metaphysical genre books. I'm yep. glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And don't forget to, you know, download that link and, you know, it'll get you at least, you know, some recaps of some of the things we talked about. And most importantly, a link to the book success predictor, which, you know, will get you then a huge checklist of things for you to, um, to answer, to really get going on your next step in your publishing and writing process. There you go. And thank, so you. thank and, you. Mark. And, and I'll uh, publish the link to that book success predictor on the YouTube channel as well. So people can That'd get it great. there. That'd Mark, I had a question for you. Um, I was getting ready to get one of your digital books. Have you changed? Cause I've seen, I know some authors when they evolve some of the stuff they've done in early books, they actually, uh, move away from, or they've, as they've evolved have you found that to be true in other words what you thought in the first book is not what you think in your third one that's that's correct and what Fabi was saying is correct is that i've evolved my thinking and and the things that i've talked about in all four of my books i looked at them as being a plateau that i could use to kind of socialize and and ask questions get feedback from people on with each of the books i published the fourth book this one, Earth's Hidden Reality Now, is the one that I'm really marketing and pushing. But it required those three books earlier on to help me sort out and clarify the things that I wanted to talk about. But it, is it it's is allowed it e me to yet? do that. Huh? Is it an ebook yet? It is an ebook. And uh, Fabie's group did it for me. So it's and a complex ebook. <laughs> a, a very complex ebook, 61 so, illustrations that vary in size. Okay. So do you go through, is it on Amazon or where's a good place to get it? it? It's on Amazon. That's where I direct everybody. Okay. Do I, do you need to read the first three books as a foundation for it? No, no, you don't. This, this no. is the one that I'm hanging my hat on. Got so it. there you go. Well, thank you, Fabi again. Thank you everybody for being here and uh, look for us in a couple weeks for the awakened mind at the consciousness cafe. Take care everyone. Sounds great. Thank you all.